You're listening to the Weekend Sport Podcast with Jason Pine from Newstalk ZB. Football Fever with Newstalk ZB's voice of football, Jason Pine and Bonnie Jansen. Hello, kia ora. Welcome into the latest edition of Football Fever. It's your podcast out every Monday for all things related to New Zealand football, particular focus on the Wellington Phoenix, on our national teams and on Kiwis playing overseas. I'm Jason Pine. Bonnie Jansen's here too. Morning, Bon. Morning, Piney. How are you? I'm feeling so good because Liverpool's draw against Manchester United works so well in Arsenal's favour. Wow! You've only (laughs) taken 23 seconds to bring that up on the podcast. Yeah, interesting result at Old Trafford this morning. I thought we were actually here to talk New Zealand football, but um, uh, yeah, it's going to make for a very interesting three-horse race. For the Premier League title now, isn't it? Yeah, no, it is. And it, it, it's kind of eerily, eerily similar to uh, what's happening in the A-League right now, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah, now that's a nice segue into what we're actually here to talk about. And that is, uh, that is as I say, matters New Zealand football. Well, let's go straight there. A-League men. Wellington Phoenix 1, Central Coast Mariners 2 on Saturday night in Gosford. Angel Torres with the opening goal just on the hour mark. Ben Old equalising for Wellington with 12 minutes to go. And then an injury time strike for Mikhail Docker giving the Mariners the victory. They go level on points with Wellington, but top of the table by virtue of having more wins than Wellington. What were your overall thoughts uh, on the game? Yeah, it's gutting. I think uh, we spoke before, Piney, Central Coast were definitely the better team and and good on them, I guess, for kind of um, getting that result and and making the run to the end so close. That's obviously going to be exciting, but... The Phoenix performance was a little bit disappointing. I I think they, you know, based on how they performed all year, they could have at least come away with the draw. Um, I thought the formation didn't work with the the three at the back or or the five at the back, um, depending on how you call it. But yeah, it didn't work. I I guess the only positive I see is that that formation didn't work. So now Chiefy can go in with more of a clear head on on what works for his team and, and the squad that he's got. Yeah, I, I totally agree on the formation. I don't, I don't like it when they play five at the back. I think they're much more effective when they play four at the back. And on top of that, on Saturday night, Lucas kelly Hill was part of the back three, and he hasn't played as part of a back three. Uh, I think he may have played centre-back growing up, but he's been a left-back on in a back four the whole season for Wellington. So to ask him to do that was, I think, interesting. Chiefy did say after the game that he thought the back five worked in the first half, so I'm not sure that he's going to abandon it altogether. However, I think now with three games to go and really, you know, victory needed in all three, I think he'll go with a more attacking sort of back four um, and then the three midfielders, three up top or whichever sort of um, combination he wants to go with. I, I, yeah, I, I thought they were a bit passive, Wellington, I, especially given the fact that the Mariners had played during the week. You look at the stats, Mariners had 62% of the possession, played... 616 passes to Wellington's 371, 221 passes in the final third for the Mariners, just 68 for the Phoenix and 23 shots to nine. So by all of those metrics, you have to say, I mean, Wellington do well or stay in the game, and they've done that all year, stay in games. But you kind of think, well, the Mariners probably deserve to win the game on those stats. Absolutely, and and the Phoenix looked unorganised at the back, and whether that was the formation, as we say, or whether that was because Central Coast just came at them, and and they deserved the win. Um, it, w- it would have been nice to sneak in a point there. It was a shame that that goal came right at the end, but um, yeah, it's something's going to need to change. I think they just need to relax a bit. Maybe the pressure's getting to them and they, they knew that they needed something from that game so that it's in their hands. The title's in their hands. It's not now, but but that's okay. It's it's um you know, they've still got every chance to take it out. Yeah, and that was the funny thing after Saturday night is I sort of had a bit of a look online, which is always a bit fraught with danger after a defeat. And I sensed all sorts of catastrophizing really I, I guess it's understandable when you consider that a win or even a draw would have really enhanced the Phoenix's chances of finishing top but some of the rhetoric I saw like I saw somebody online say it's going to take a miracle to finish top now well I look at the table and the two teams are still level uh, you know both still have to play three games and the big wild card in all of this is that the Mariners are still involved in the Asian Knockout Cup they've got to go to Kyrgyzstan and back two extra games Starting on Saturday, they've got five games in 14 days 
including that long trip to Asia. And only one of their remaining three matches in the A-League is at home. By contrast, the Phoenix only have the three games left, two of them at home. I, I feel like it's still all on for that Premier's plate. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, even though we would have liked to see the Phoenix go six points clear after Saturday, it, it's just going to make it more exciting and, and hopefully more people get around it. So, yeah, I, I'm surprised that everyone online was so panicked, as you say. But, um, yeah, still everything to play for. And I'm really excited. We know what this team's done all season long, so there's there's no reason why they can't push it till the end. Yeah, and speaking of that, they've stayed in games all season long, and they did that again on Saturday night. You know, off you know against the stats that I just mentioned before, they still found a way to get back in the game through Ben Old's goal, and, and as you say, were level going into added time at the end of the game, and and could have uh, have come away with a point. You know, they they stay in games whether it's um, scoring goals to equalise or, or just finding a way to pick up points. I mean, just their fourth loss of the season in 24 games speaks to their ability to accumulate points. I thought they really missed Alex Rufa. Um, that's probably not a surprising statement, but he's been so good this season. Uh, he'll come back into the team for the game against victory. Uh, here's what it looks like now. The Mariners have 46 points. The Phoenix have 46 points. Victory have 41 points. The Phoenix now cannot finish outside the top three, so that would equal their best ever finish. And now, as I say, it's a straight sprint to the finish line. They just have to try and win their remaining three games and hope that the Mariners slip up in the midst of what is a very busy schedule for them. On the face of things, it's a much tougher run-in for Wellington with the teams they have to play. But what we saw over the weekend, surprises happen in this league, and, and I'm sure there'll be another couple of twists and turns before the regular season finishes. Yeah, there's no reason why they why they can't do it. And as you say, that run in, yes, they're tough games for the Phoenix, but um, they've also, a lot of things is going to play in their favour and that's playing at home twice. Uh, we know how good they've been at home all season. And I'm just so excited for this team. I, I want to shout out, you know, players like Finn Sermon and Alex Paulson who have, who have just, you know, kept kept this team in it and and we saw that over the weekend it was a shame that they conceded that late goal but I, I think they're going to be key going forward in these next next few games and they've they've kind of got nothing to lose now knowing that they're going to finish top three they, they definitely want to secure a top two spot so hopefully the pressure's a little bit off them and and they can just go and have fun just before we move on to the victory game just want to mention Mariners I really like the Central Coast Mariners they're a good team yeah you know, and given the fact they won it last year and then lost a big chunk of their squad to be where they are uh, I you know I, I think you have to give a huge amount of kudos to them I really like the way they play I think Danny Vukovic is a terrific goalkeeper and leader of that team Storm Rue Josh Nisbet, Mikel Docker had a really good game. Uh, Angel Torres, I, I was I wasn't really convinced about him at the start of the season, but I thought he was tremendous on Saturday night. They're a good team, the Mariners, and I, you know, one very possible scenario, Bonnie, is that uh, the Phoenix do play them again when finals roll around, maybe even in the grand final. So let's move on and look at Friday night, Melbourne victory, Sky Stadium, a win would secure a top two finish for the Phoenix for the first time ever and give them a first-round buy into the final series. A loss would mean victory would come to within two points of the Phoenix, and a draw would maintain the five-point gap back to third, but um, would allow the Mariners to go a couple of points clear if they can beat Western United on Saturday. So what are your initial start-of-the-week thoughts about this game on Friday night? Well, I hope the crowd get up for it, you know, a a Friday night game. I think the Hurricanes are playing the next day down in in Wellington, so it's it's going to be a good weekend of of sport in the capital. But, yeah, I just hope everyone gets around the team. There's not many games left, and they have a real – I mean, they've already made so much history this season, but they have a real shot of going all the way. So, um, yeah, I'm I'm feeling good. It's it's not best-case scenario, but, uh, yeah, I'm confident that they can – go out and, and achieve what we all know they can. I know history's only one side of this, but but victory have historically been pretty hard uh, for the Phoenix to beat. Uh, 48 games between these two. The Phoenix have only won 11 of those 48. Uh, victory have won 24. There have been 13 draws, including both matches this season. But on the other side of things, after each of their losses this season, the Phoenix have bounced back with a very good performance. When they lost to the Jets, they bounced back and beat MacArthur 3-0. 
After they lost to Sydney, they drew two all away at Adelaide, which has always been a really hard place for them to get anything. And after their 1-0 loss to Melbourne City, they beat Sydney FC 2-1 at Eden Park in Auckland. So they have really good bounce-back ability. And look, I, I just really quite like the calmness that Chiefy brought to everything after the after the, the final whistle. He wasn't panicking. He wasn't riding. He doesn't ride the highs too high or the lows too low. He constantly says every game's worth three points. And now they just refocus. Mm, no, exactly. It's, um, yeah, it's no panic stations yet at all. And even if they don't get that pre- preliminary title, um, you know, I, I think we've still got the playoffs and they want to be in the best position for that. And, and that's finishing second, if not first. So, yeah. Everything to play for, you know, nothing to lose. Yeah, every, I mean, even a draw isn't a bad result on Friday. I know they'll go out and try and win it, but even a draw is not a bad result mm. because it, it keeps them five points clear of Melbourne victory with only two games left. So victory would have to win both of those two games and the Phoenix would have to slip up uh, in their remaining two um, to, you know, to fall out of the top two. So I think, I think that's, you know, the, the next point of business is to get a good result against victory on Friday night Secure that place in the top two, and then think about what lies beyond that. Uh, the return of Roly Bonavazia will be very, um, very interesting as well. Eighty games across three seasons for Wellington. Now on the roster of Melbourne Victory, I'm sure a lot of people are looking forward to seeing <laughs> Roly uh, back in uh, back at Sky Stadium, albeit in a uh, in a different colour shirt. This is Football Fever. Let's go to the Football Ferns, who are in the middle of a two match series against Thailand in Christchurch. Game two is tomorrow night. Game one was on Saturday. 4-0. The Football Ferns beating Thailand. Goals to Hannah Wilkinson, Jackie Hand and two to Katie Kitching off the bench. You've been asking for goals from this side. <laughs> Bonnie, you'd be fairly happy with four? Happy, yes. It was It was a good display. I'm not going to lie. I was a little bit panicked after 60 minutes when we had only scored one. I thought that was a little bit concerning. But um yeah, pr- promising signs for the Ferns. I'd like to see them back it up, and if not, um, you know, get even a few more uh, tomorrow night. But we'll, we'll see how they go. Thailand didn't get a single shot on goal. Anna Elite was pretty much unemployed in goal for uh, for New Zealand. So you know that speaks obviously to a good defensive performance, but also a fairly limited opposition. Uh, it's the first time New Zealand have scored four goals against non Oceania opposition since 2017. It was also against Thailand when they scored five. Uh, the lineup. What did you do? You make of the lineup? I, I saw it come through, and I I really liked the look of the starting eleven. I must say. Yeah, I really liked it as well. Um, really good to see Macy Fraser get a start. We've um, you know know how well she's done for the Phoenix and in that Oceania Olympic qualifier not long ago. But I, I was really keen to see how she played. She would. She would play for the Ferns against a side like Thailand, who, you know, aren't maybe the strongest opposition that we could be playing in an international window. But, you know, obviously a step up for Macy, and and she held her own. She did really well. She, she looked dangerous from the get go and was and it had quite a few shots on target. But um, you know, she looked really good. It was great to have CJ Bott back. She is, she's. I, I think she's the best player New Zealand's. Have it, has ever had on the women's side um, and yeah no so really good really good uh, promising signs from the from the fans. I like the intent of their formation as well and that it was a it was a 4-3-3 but it was really a front five. Um, Malia mm. Steinmet sort of sat in that defensive midfield role that she's become really really good at and then there was Fraser, India Page Riley, Grace Jarley, Hannah Wilkinson and Jackie Hand so five attacking players really I really like the intent of it you know and and I guess it remains to be seen what Yitka does with the the, the uh, team for game two. Um, I know, you know, that sh- there's only limited opportunities for, for players to, you know, press their claims for a spot at the Olympics. But I wouldn't be at all disappointed if they went out with effectively the same side tomorrow night. Yeah, that's how I feel as well. I would love to see some other players get opportunities, maybe the likes of Mickey Foster, who I understand was injured in the first game, uh, coming at fullback, or, or Mackenzie Barry, um, or, or maybe have a play around with the front line. But in saying that, I, I feel like we need some consistency and we need the, the, squ- the side to start gelling with the Olympics coming up. We've got a really, really tough group uh, playing the host France uh, at, at, at Paris later this year. So 
uh, yeah, I would like to see this this team have every opportunity, every minute they can to kind of play together because I feel like Yitka was almost bang on with uh, the the strongest well strongest lineup in my opinion anyway. Um, and so yeah, it'd be good to good to see them connect as as much as they can. Yeah, I agree. I, I think it's it's close to what I would have chosen. And you know, you and I are just you know we just observers aren't we yet because the one who has to live and die by the results that the team she puts out (laughs) gets but yeah look i'm looking at it on the screen right now it's i'm not sure that i would have made more than one or two tweaks to that you know for the for the players who are available mickey foster i think i i think long term will be the the left fullback in this team and that might have to wait till after the olympics i'm not sure um yeah but but other than that i i as i say really like the attacking intent i would quite like to see Emma Pinenberg, I know she only came in as a as a replacement for Kate Taylor when she was ruled out through injury, but she's a New Zealand under-20 international. She's playing in the top tier of Dutch women's football with Feyenoord, um, scored a goal in that um, in that league uh, a week or so ago. I, I just would quite like to see what she's got about her, you know? Yeah, I've uh, watched Emma throughout uh, the Auckland League the last few years, or maybe the last four or five years. She's an unreal player I think her call up is very very overdue to the football ferns um and it's a shame that it's happened at the expense of Kate Taylor but yeah she she deserves her call up in that team and you know uh yeah she she would be great I I think she would absolutely hold her own and and could get minutes in that team no doubt so yeah it'd be good to good to see her come on and and Yik is pretty good with you know new ferns and calling them up and and giving them opportunities when they can. So who knows? We might see that tomorrow night. What do you reckon she'll do in goal? I reckon stick with Anna Leek. Uh You know, Anna's playing, she's starting for one of the best clubs in the world right now consistently. Um, or I don't know if you can say what four games is consistent, but it, it, it's pretty promising. And as as we just discussed, they need consistency, this team, and and. All we want to do is build and grow the confidence of an elite. So, um, yeah, she needs to be in the best form she can be for Paris because she's probably going to have a lot of, a lot of goals coming, a lot of shots coming her way. So, um, yeah, I, I say stick with her. Yeah, I, I would do the same. So, yeah, so the the team the other day was Leet, uh, Bot, Bowen, Stott, and Riley, Fraser, Steinmetz. Riley, that's India Page Riley the second time, Hand, Wilkins and Jale. I, yeah, like I said, wouldn't be at all uh, disappointed if she stuck with that. Uh, then there's Claudia Bunge, Katie Kitching, of course, who came off the bench and got a couple of goals. So maybe you look at what she might do in, the, uh, in a starting role. Gabby Rennie, Page Satchel, Daisy Cleverly, Mackenzie Barry all got some minutes. And then the likes of uh, of Pine and Berg, Ruby Nathan, Michaela Moore, Ellie Green, uh, were others who didn't see any game time. So yeah, we'll wait and see what... Um, what Gitka does. One thing we do know is that uh, Rhea Percival will not play again for New Zealand. The Football Ferns and, in fact, New Zealand's most capped player, 166 appearances in a career going all the way back to 2006 when she debuted at the age of 16, five World Cups, four Olympic Games. Were you surprised to see this announcement of her international retirement? Um. I mean, I wasn't surprised because there were signs. Or, or Yitka mentioned she had uh, Ria had been thinking about it uh, when she named the squad for this tour a few weeks ago. So we knew that R- Ria had been considering this. Am I surprised about the timing? A hundred percent. You know, whether we agree or not that Ria should be starting in this team, I think she would have had a starting spot come Paris in July, and and to pull out kind of what, two months, three months before an Olympic Games is a little bit confusing. Why not have have one more, you know, on your football CV? Um, but, but again, there was no mention of of maybe a, a reason why she called it now. Um, I, I guess she has been struggling for minutes at her, at her club over in England. Maybe that's why she wants to just put all her focus in there. But well, yeah, she, I mean, she was, she was at Tottenham, but then she's been getting good minutes at Crystal Palace, where she's on loan. Yeah. Uh, I think she's getting a good run of games. It, yeah, like I say, I look at. Okay, put it this way: Yitka's going to name an eighteen-strong squad for the Olympics. If she was available, would Rhea Percival make that eighteen? I think the answer is probably yeah. yes, isn't it? Yeah, hundred percent. And you know, maybe I personally not sure if that would have been the best. Um, if it would be the best option to be starting Rhea, you know, just knowing her age and, and the players coming through. We've got some really, really good midfielders who we've just mentioned. Um, but I still think she would have. I, I, I think, you know, history shows 
that um, these football, f- uh, the New Zealand football and, and the football ferns have always consistently played their more senior players and their veterans. So I think going into the Olympics, Rhea would have uh, started for the ferns and probably worn the armband. So why she doesn't want to be involved in that, I think there's there's something deeper going on. Yeah, interesting um, timing. That is the, the, the interesting part of it. I think if she had gone to the Olympics and then said, right, that's it, everybody mm. would have said, okay, well, that feels right. You know, you've been an amazing servant for this team. You've uh, That would have been her fifth Olympics uh, to go with five World Cups. I mean, and there's very few players in the world who could boast a record like that. She had that knee injury. She suffered in early 2022. Had to really fight hard to get back and make the squad for the World Cup last year. Started every game, but hasn't played for New Zealand tellingly since last year's World Cup while she clearly mulls things over. And she's arrived on the uh, the fact that this will be it for her. So, yeah, a lot of uh, outpouring of a lot of praise from uh, former teammates, current teammates, and others uh, for Rhea Percival. She'll uh, she'll call it a day internationally with 166 caps to her name. Football fever. Just finally, some Kiwis overseas. Just want to talk about a couple of uh, interesting uh, performances. Chris Wood got another goal for Nottingham Forest. That's uh, four in four games now. He scored in his last four, nine in his last ten Premier League games. 67 Premier League goals all time. I also saw this morning, he and you can stats can tell you anything, he's leading the league in, in goals per 90 minutes. He's got 0.84 goals per 90 minutes. Uh, Erling Haaland is second on that list. I don't know what that stat proves, but <laughs> he's in pretty good form, Chris. What he, uh, he's doing all he can to keep Forrest in the Premier League. Yeah, I, I'd rate Chris Wood. I, I hope... Um he is one of the overage players that comes with the Ollie Whites to the Olympics. I don't know when that gets decided, but I feel like I need to get Darren Baisley on the phone to make sure that's happening because, you know, he would be so good for us there. I think I think with Chris Wood, it's kind of we've reached the point with him now where he, he decides, uh, and I he, he's all and he's always said that he wants to. So I think he mm. will be one of the three. We can perhaps talk about that on a future pod as to who the other two might be. But I think if he says, "Yeah, I want to come," and Darren Baisley says, "Okay, yeah." You should come. I know there are thoughts that you should perhaps look to the future and the likes of Ben Wayne and Max Mata, who are both, I think Max Mata is still under 23, um, you know, are guys who you might want to, you know, give an opportunity to. But if Chris but Wood, why would you? Well, I, and I feel like, like when he's that good, like yeah. maybe if there wasn't a, that big of a gap, but it's like surely, you know? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I, I, look, I'd pick him. I, I think if Chris Wood's available to play a game of football for you, you pick him for that game of football. That, yeah. That's how good he is. And in a rich vein of form, uh, which, as I say, is um, he's doing all he can to to keep Nottingham Forest in the Premier League. That that goal this morning um, was part of a 3-1 loss to Spurs. But, uh, yeah, there's still a few chapters to be written at the uh, relegation end of the Premier League. Uh, Libby Kikachi uh, chalked up his first assist for Empoli uh, in their 3-2 win over Torino. Uh, this was an important win for Empoli. They'd lost their previous four games. Uh, this win, though, takes them two points clear of the relegation zone with seven games to go, uh, and it came in the third minute of added time. So a pretty important time for Libby Kakachi to assist a winner for Empoli. Uh, Matt Garbett got an assist for Nak Breda overnight, one all draw in their latest game. Uh, he, um, another stat here, I'm not sure whether it's entirely meaningful, but um, when you add goals and assists together per 90 minutes, he's uh, 0.51 goals and assists per 90 minutes. So I guess that means he's either assisting a goal or scoring a goal once every couple of games, which is a pretty good stat. And Tyler Binden uh, continues to impress for Reading, certainly as a defender, but also scored an 83rd minute equaliser for them in their one-all draw with Lincoln. Over the weekend, no uh, women in action because of the international window, of course. I think that's us, Bonnie. Interesting week ahead. Uh, football ferns tomorrow night and uh, Phoenix on Friday. So um, it doesn't really stop, does it? No, but another big week. I'm looking forward to it. I don't know what I'm going to do when it's all over, Piney. <laughs> oh, the Olympics will roll around soon enough. Oh, we'll, be yeah, able to, true. we'll be able to talk about that. Thank you for joining us on Football <laughs> Fever. A fresh episode hits your podcast feed around about the same time next Monday. Football Fever on iHeartRadio. For more from Weekend Sport with Jason Pine, listen live to News Talk ZB weekends from midday or follow the podcast on iHeartRadio.